Good evening, brothers and sisters. Uh, glad to be with you all again that we're, we are here to worship God. And I was really reflecting this afternoon just how important worship is. Worship is our most distinctively Christian thing that we do. We could all try to be moral people like others that are trying to be moral and do the right thing. But the fact that we come together to worship the one true and living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that's really, you could say, the most Christian thing that we do. And as the church, we are the worshiping community. That's what distinguishes us as God's people, is that we are the ones that approach God by faith and worship the Lord. So, wonderful to be back again this evening to worship God, to do what it is we are created to do. Uh, by way of announcements, just as particularly I want to point out Friday night fellowship happening this Friday, 6 o'clock here at the church. It's a chilly cook-off and a movie. And in these uh, wintry months, where we're often maybe not getting out as much as we would wish. Uh, what a wonderful opportunity to be able to come to share a meal together, get to know one another better. Um, lots of people that are new to the community, visiting. Uh, what a great time to avail yourself of a time to really be able to sit down and get to know some brothers and sisters in the faith. So uh, see the sign-ups for that. Uh, let's stand as the Lord calls us to worship from Psalm 138. Psalm 138, verses 1 to 2. This is God's word. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. Amen. I was struck this afternoon thinking about just the phrase, a heart-to-heart. -heart. If you've said you've ever had a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with someone, you know it means that your heart was open to them, theirs to you, and there was a special connection. And I was realizing that in a real way, all our worship services ought to be a heart-to-heart -heart with God. As we open our hearts to Him, as our text said, to give wholehearted thanksgiving to God. In our prayers and our praises, we want to be opening the inner parts of us to God. We confess our sins, feeling free to show him our weaknesses. We bring our thanksgiving and our deepest joys to God. But we also know that God has shared his innermost heart with us in his word. God's heart opened up to you and me. So as we express our heart to God and God expresses his heart to us, we can have an expectation of a wonderful experience of worship as we come together to praise. So let's open our mouths in praise, singing together from Psalm 111b.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do desire and delight to sing your praises through all ages. We thank you that from you, redemption has come to your people. The knowledge of salvation through Jesus Christ. We thank you that your heart has been opened for us, even as Christ's side was opened. His blood spilled for the forgiveness of sins. His resurrection guaranteeing the justification of your people. His ascension and rule and intercession guaranteeing that none of his will be lost, but all come to their final resting place. Indeed, we have so much good in Jesus, so much hope for what is yet to come. We ask that this evening, that our hearts would be opened to you, our great and gracious God, that we would pour out our praises and our thanks to you, pour out even our tears and our sorrows, and that we will be attentive to hear your heart towards us in your word, the heart of God shown through Christ, shown through the gospel, and even your kind heart shown in the ways you call us to live. Would your spirit strengthen us and grant us focus and open hearts that we might glorify your name together in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Let's sing of our great and holy God. Holy, holy, holy. So wonderful to just reflect on God's holiness, that he is totally other than us. It's, it's not just that he's like us, but better, but so qualitatively different, it's unimaginable. He's incomprehensible. And yet this sovereign, eternal and immortal Lord is both merciful, even as he's mighty. 
and that he condescends to show mercy to such as you and me is amazing. To come and defeat sin and death in Christ and raise and um, to reign to rule now over us as his people. And as we look at Psalm 47 tonight in our consecutive psalm readings, we're considering this, it's a victory psalm, a psalm about God as king ruling over the whole world. We don't know the exact occasion on which this psalm was composed. It talks about God having gone up with a shout, which might hint to us that this is talking about when the ark was rescued from enemies and ascended up the Mount of Jerusalem, the city on a hill, coming to rest. And that that would fit the idea both of the victory over the enemies and God going up. Remember, the ark came up with shouts and praises. And symbolically, God's presence in the temple on the mount is a picture of his reigning over his people. But in a greater way, as we know the Psalms are prophetic literature, we can read this psalm thinking about the ascension of Christ. Christ defeated death and sin, was triumphing over them in the cross, and he has gone up with a shout and the sound of a trumpet to reign and rule. And as the psalm says, he is the king over all the earth. Now, Christ is king of the earth, but the question is, is have we submitted ourselves to his rule? And our heart's desire is that all peoples would bow the knee to Jesus, that all tongues would confess his lordship now in this life before they will do it in compulsion at the end. And so let's consider Psalm 47 together. God's holy word to the choir master, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord the Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob whom he loves, Selah. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. And just as God has gone up with a shout and the sound of a trumpet, so we know that Christ will return also with the sound of a trumpet to receive his people to himself, to sit on his throne, judging the nations in righteousness. And so this psalm fittingly leads us to our prayer for missions and evangelism for God's work, that we would see Christ's rule and reign become more and more a reality in this world, that he would have the reward for which he died. Um, As we think of the the different items that come to us from um, in the emails in the week, I wanted to just a focus some prayers on Harvest Church tonight, the church that planted us, one we love dearly, and uh, they're being featured for prayer, and so uh, we will pray for them. Please join your hearts with me. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you that Jesus Christ was raised in victory, that you raised him from the dead, and you raised him up even to the heavenly places. And that we can look to him as a conquering king, as an atoning sacrifice, and now as a continuing intercessor. Thank you, Father, for the access we have to your throne of grace through Jesus. His is the victory. And through him, we pray that all peoples will come to know you, especially will come to know your name as Father. And through faith in Christ, find acceptance into the family of God and that adoption as sons and daughters awaiting an amazing eternal inheritance. Would Christ's kingdom come on the earth, that you would bless your churches, that they would be increasingly full with those who are truly converted, have truly repented and put faith in Christ. Would your will be done on this world? Lord, we see so much sin, so much wickedness, and we ask that your people will set an example of holiness, an example of the sort of life that Christ himself lived 
and that fittingly, your people will be called Christians, ones who are like Christ. Lord, we pray for the witness and ministry of Harvest Church here in Wyoming. We thank you for their kingdom generosity, that vision they have to see more and more churches started, more and more cities placed on hills, more and more lampstands giving glory to Jesus. Lord, we pray that you will bless their ministries, that you will grant their elders support and strength in the burdens of shepherding, particularly that you will grant them wisdom and vision as they seek to wisely navigate a growing congregation and the challenges that brings. Lord, we pray for those in the congregation that are in times of acute suffering, having received discouraging diagnoses, difficult news, and we pray that you would be near. Holy Spirit, that you would be a comforter to these suffering sheep. Lord, we also pray a special blessing on the new radio ministry they've started, Simple Grace. And we ask that every ear that hears the words coming from that program will be drawn to give greater attention to God and especially to know Christ. Lord, we pray that you will continue to make them fruitful even as they continue to be faithful. Lord, we pray for ourselves here at Grace Fellowship that you would make this a kingdom citadel, an embassy, where sinners come to find salvation in Christ, where the saints are strengthened and sent out into those white fields of harvest. Lord, we pray for all the public evangelism in this place, that week by week as the gospel is preached, that the Spirit would be working to transform hearts, to open blind eyes, and to renew minds, to see the goodness of Jesus that you will help us to be ready and willing to invite others to come and hear all that you have done for us in Christ. Would you bless, Lord, all of the conversations we have with outsiders, with those who don't know you, that we would be faithful conversational partners, be ones whose words are seasoned with salt and who know how to wisely answer each one, that we would be ready to honor Christ in our hearts as holy, to speak the truth in love, to speak especially of the grace we've found in Christ. Lord, would you bless the witness of each member that as they go out week by week, that their lives will speak of the value of Christ and how they follow him in paths of holiness, that the world would think it strange when they run not with them into the same flood of passions, but that you will help your people to maintain a witness of purity in increasingly corrupt times that your people would have a witness of helpfulness as ones who have known the mercy of Christ, who show mercy to others, who love their families, who show love to their clients and the people they work with, who show love to their neighbors and communities, and who witness that witness of Psalm 128 of the blessed man who fears the Lord and walks in his ways. Would we know the blessed joy of being people that follow Jesus? And would you use your worship and word to equip us for that task? Would you forgive us for all our sins and failings for Jesus' sake? Grant us everything we need to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in your sight forever. We pray these things, knowing you hear us because of our mediator. And so we come in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. We desire in our prayers that God would be our vision, our delight, the one we're pursuing. So let's stand and sing this prayer song, Be Thou My Vision.
you may be seated. And we can express that confidence, that riches I heed not, by expressing our generosity in giving, and the offering is going to be taken tonight for the building fund. So I'll invite the deacons forward. Let us pray. Our holy and loving Father in heaven, we thank you for bestowing us with whatever we need to live. Few of us now work the land or build homes so we can fail to appreciate how you provide for us. You have brought us to a deeper appreciation of how you care for us when we now see empty shelves in the stores or difficulty buying materials at work. So Lord, we thank you for providing for us, for our families, for our church, and for our community. We thank you for the land, the rain, farmers, factory workers, and those in shipping and food preparation, all who allow us to eat every day. As the world worries about the supply chain, Lord, we praise you for supplying the materials and people who form each link in the chain and trust that you will continue to provide for us. And Lord, you have provided us this space to worship you and from which to serve our community. So bless this offering of funds for your building that we may know how to best use it to your glory. Lord, you have supplied us with J.C. Davison in the pulpit to preach from your word. Holy Spirit, supply us with eager hearts and minds to be nourished today. In Jesus' name, amen. You can turn once again in your copies of God's word to James and James chapter 3. James chapter 3, we'll be looking at verses 1 to 12. Uh, A a very uh, illustrative passage, a very colorful passage James gives us with lots of metaphor and simile and illustration, all meant to really reinforce one major point to us, one topic, that of the tongue. So let's consider God's word from James chapter 1, or James chapter 3, sorry, verses 1 to 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, 
They are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Amen. May the Lord bless us as we look to his word together. Now, James, really, he's been bringing a very challenging message to the Christians to whom he's been writing. He's been writing about what authentic religious practice looks like in the outworking among us. He's reminded the congregation in chapter 1 to be doers of the word and not self-deceived hearers. He taught that true religion consists in bridling the tongue, in caring for widows and orphans, and keeping oneself unstained from the world. And he looks specifically at the sin of discrimination in the church and how the church ought to practice that law of love, to love one another as themselves. And he turns from there to look at the fact that true faith, has to result in works, good works. And looking at this, the works then, he turns from this idea of the good works that evidence a true faith to the works of our words. And he turns here to discuss the tongue. And before he gives us any particular directive about how to use our tongues, he spends much of his time enforcing on us the power of the tongue and the danger of the tongue, that we might be careful with our words. I've entitled this message, A Small But Mighty. Uh, That's an idiom people say. uh, Apparently comes from the Latin parvus sed potens, which just uh, just sounds good to say, parvus sed potens. But it's it's been remarked that this idea, small but mighty, could could very well uh, apply to the northern pygmy owl, which is a very tiny owl, but it'll attack a hunter that gets too close. It attacks prey much greater than itself. And so in many ways, the northern pygmy owl is small but mighty. And similarly, this human tongue, it's so small, but yet powerful, even deadly and dangerous. And if we can learn to understand the incredible weight and power our words have, then we'll be much more diligent to frame our words in accordance with the law of love, to love our neighbors as ourselves by speaking about our neighbors the way we'd want to be spoken of. And so the big idea tonight is that the Christian who desires to honor God in his speech will be careful to honor God's image bearers by carefully controlling his tongue and watchfully weighing his words. Okay, the Christian who desires to honor God in his speech will be careful to honor God's image bearers by carefully considering his words, watchfully weighing what he says. So let's turn our attention, take a look with me at verse 1 as we just walk through this passage together. James begins, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. And so as James is turning his attention from the works that evidence our faith to this discussion of the tongue, he begins with a very specific application. He talks about speech in the congregation, the speech of teaching. And he says that not many of you should become teachers because you know that we're judged with greater strictness. Right, right? And we implicitly recognize that speech that is public to more and more people is adjudicated with greater scrutiny because there's a greater influence. There's a greater ability to mislead and to harm. 
And so James is warning them, not many of you should become teachers. There's a higher accountability. And I know many of you would recognize that fact if it was said, hey, you need to come and preach the word next week. There'd be that thought of, I don't think I'd be cut out for that. That's important. That's weighty. And I'm not sure I'd have the words to say. I might mess it up and say something wrong. And James is using this idea to then jump from there to say, exactly, you recognize the weight of words in that sort of context and how hard it is to speak carefully and considerately to speak truth and not error, but we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. So he's doing an interesting turn here, moving from a very specific instance to jump the congregation into a more general truth. That if we know how easy it is to slip up in public speech, how much do we need to be careful about our speech in general? We all stumble in many ways. And he says, if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. And there's a general truth here that a person who is controlled and disciplined and careful with what they say is probably self-disciplined and controlled in other areas of their life, whether in their work or with their health or in their family life. That is, the virtue of temperance, of self-discipline, it carries forward to many different areas of life. And if you can get that tongue under control, that speaks well to what the rest of you is going to be doing. And he uses this term here, bridled. You'd be able to bridle also the whole body. And this is hearkening back to what he said about the tongue in chapter 1. In chapter 1, verse 26, James said, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, that person's religion is worthless. And here he's reiterating this bridling idea that the tongue needs to be bridled. And he's going to use that illustration of of a horse and a bridle. But it's important to note that the tongue here is a focal point that all religiosity can center around. He says in that uh, chapter 1 verse that if you don't bridle your tongue, you have a worthless religion. And that is the tongue can become this uh, barometer, this marker of how the rest of life is going. And though we may often easily pat ourselves on the back for how we've avoided a lot of the big sins out in the world, yet don't our tongues condemn us all too readily. We know that it is difficult to bridle the tongue. And we need to recognize just how powerful and influential our words can be. Look at verse 3. James gives us two illustrations um, to enforce this point. Not just one. He doubles up on the illustrations. He says, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they're guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. The tongue is small, but mighty. And consider these illustrations. Each of them have three components. So you have a ship, a rudder, and a pilot. You have a horse, a bridle, and a rider. Now, the, the, the ship, the horse, that's the, the, the whole life. And we're moving around, and it says the ship is blown about by winds, right? In, and in life, as we're walking around, winds come, storms come, provocations, different situations. But the rudder can navigate that ship through them, and it can really turn the whole course of the ship. That small bit in the horse's mouth can turn that powerful beast in a direction. And our tongues really influence the direction we go in life, the way our relationships are navigated. Now, this just isn't saying that the tongue has a great effect, but we often forget that third piece in each of these, the pilot and the rider. James says that the ship goes wherever the will of the pilot directs. And so we need to not just give up right off the bat and say, ah, the tongue's unruly, what can be done with it? But the call here is to be a careful pilot, a careful horse rider that um, skillfully and delicately navigates the powerful emotions we can feel, situations we can encounter to steer the right course. And so there's an implicit call here to us to be very careful with our words and how we speak, to pay more attention to them 
Because consider the pilot in the cruise ship that's not paying attention, right? You might remember, I think it was an Italian cruise ship. It rammed right on up on this landmass. Uh, the captain wasn't paying attention. And so we, we can go astray, perhaps hit an iceberg, if we're not careful with our words. The horse and the rider who's not paying attention, he might get lost, wander off the path, might get thrown off. But we're called to pay careful attention to our words, because though our mouth is small, it has powerful and influential effects in our lives. We ought to be serious about our speech. And James continues talking about how dangerous our words are. And they're not just powerful and influential, but they actually can be deadly. Halfway through verse 5, take a look. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. The tongue has great influence and the ability to destroy. Remember what Proverbs 18.21 says, but death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life. Words can impart life. Words can take away life. And we rightly think of this uh, spiritually or perhaps emotionally, how our words affect people, but even think of the power of our words physically. Um, in, in doing some research, I learned this week of the Italian Hall disaster of 1913. Uh, this took place actually right in Michigan in a, in a town called Calame. I don't know, is it Calame or Calumet? I wasn't sure on the pronunciation. But that town in Michigan, in 1913, there was a bunch of mining families that were having a, a Christmas Eve sort of party with their work. Um, these miners, their wives, their children. And someone ended up yelling fire in this gathering. And the ensuing stampede led to 73 deaths and 59 of those deaths were children. And now it's unknown whether the person who yelled this out was doing it ma maliciously, or whether it was just ignorantly and foolishly, but one word led to 73 deaths. The power of speech and the way it communicates is a weighty consideration. It says, how great a force is set ablaze by such a small fire. The small spark from a cigarette starts in uh, acres, millions of acres of forest fires. And so it can be with our words. And often we don't see the damage of our words physically, but words create this sort of burning and death emotionally, psychologically. How many of you would even be able to think that there's words that perhaps a parent said to you with your, with, when you were young. One sentence or phrase that's emblazoned on your mind, and you're never going to forget it. It's scars that you still live with, the power of words that, can, that stay with us and do us such damage. James says the tongue is a fire. It's a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. It's interesting, he says how our tongues, it sets on fire our own course of life, and it stains the whole body. Our words have a way of coloring us, of staining us, and of creating fires even in our own life. Consider the way our words affect our reputations. Um, I was reminded of um, probably um, a decade or so ago, um, I... In a short period of time, I, uh, in my youthful zeal, I foolishly I wrote two Facebook posts that were particularly controversial and um, offended people, and you can't find them. They're taken down, so don't go try to look. But they hurt my reputation for years. I gained the reputation as the controversy guy, the offensive guy, and even though I tried to retract what I said, clarify, um, and I would tell people, I'm like, look, I've posted 200 times. It's just these two. And yet, just the influence of those words, they colored me. And in some ways, they even made ministry at that time difficult because of just the way it spread. Our words can set our lives on fire. Our words can color us, stain our reputations. And the problem and difficulty here is that we never are able to gain perfect mastery over what we say. 
James says that so clearly in verse 7. Every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. James says no human being can tame the tongue. And we, not, we ought not take this to the strictest degree that we can't at all tame the tongue and we ought just give up. James commands in chapter 1 that we have to bridle our tongues to even be Christians. So we can bridle our tongues, pay attention to our words, but what he's saying is we, we can never gain a full mastery. We can never totally domesticate um, our tongues and the words we say. We'll never gain that perfect control over our speech. And James, in saying this, he's being a realist, not a defeatist. He knows that we will never have that perfect control. But yet, we are called to grow and to seek to bridle our words. He says, every kind of animal has been tamed. And it's really crazy. He mentions even the large sea creatures. How wild is it that, um, I remember back in the day, Shamu at SeaWorld. I don't know if they're allowed the whales anymore. But this huge whale doing tricks, smiling, uh, spitting up water from this human trainer that he could bulldoze. And this huge beast is domesticated in a sense, controlled and tamed. And yet, even though we can direct 16,000 pound beasts, we have trouble directing this two and a half ounce muscle in our mouth. No one can tame the tongue. And don't you experience this in your own life? Uh, we think, oh, why did I say that? Why did I make that stupid joke? Why did I mention that anecdote at that timing? Uh, why did I bring up that subject? How did I let that cuss word slip out? Why did I utter that insult? How could I have used such a harsh tone? Why did I have to be so sarcastic? How could I have said that about my spouse, my parent, my friends? Whenever we think we've got a handle on our speech, something happens and it runs away from us. And so James concludes that our tongue is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Our tongues can actually poison others. Now at times, maybe it's just the poison of uh, the venom of a bee sting, or maybe it's the poison of a rattlesnake. But our words have negative effects on others. We need to know the deadly power of our tongue. Why? Again, so that we will carefully control our speech and watchfully weigh our words like the careful pilot, the careful rider. If we know that there's venom in our mouths, we'll handle it carefully, right? Wouldn't you handle a venomous snake much more carefully uh, than a wiggling worm, right? You'd be careful because you know the danger. So we ought to be careful with our words. And now James, he's going to talk to us about one particular venom he wants us to avoid. There's much he could say about all the different ways to control our speech, whether in truthfulness or kindness, but he's going to apply this in one very particular relational context. Take a look with me at verse 9. He says, With it, that is with our tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. And James is pointing out to us here uh, this doubleness of our tongues. The fact that our tongues can hold both the power of life and the power of death. And this stark juxtaposition that we can be lifting up God one moment and tearing down God's creatures the next, speaking as it were out of both sides of our mouths. When he says here, blessing God, this is referring to uh, lifting God up, giving him praise, worship, thanksgiving. And this word he uses for cursing people has this uh, downward connotation, condemning them, tearing them down, pulling them low. And we can think of words that are disparaging, that are dishonoring of others, demeaning, of others, dismissive of others, cursing people, tearing them down. Verse 10, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. Emphatically, my brothers, these things ought not be so. This is not the way it's supposed to be. This mouth we use to bless God ought not be used to tear down people. 
And it's almost as if James would say that this actually doesn't make any logical sense. How could this be that our tongues bless God and curse people? Does a spring pour forth from the same opening fresh in salt water? Can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? That is, this ought to be so unnatural to us, wildly unnatural, the fact that a tongue could be used in these two ways. It's as odd as a different kinds of water coming out of an opening, or a fig tree producing grapes, or whatever you think of, a tomato plant that, that makes, that makes uh, nuts. It just it doesn't go together, it doesn't make sense. It's against nature. And if you think about it, it is unnatural. In God's original design, we weren't able to speak evil of people. We were able to bless God, but the thought of cursing a person didn't exist until sin entered this world. And that's why sin is such an intrusion into the natural order, that sin is fundamentally unnatural. And it creates this confusion that we can, in a sense, hypocritically praise God, but then curse God's image bearers. And this is why this is such an issue for James. It's, uh, he says so clearly, this ought not be so, that we would be able to demean and disparage people. And the reason is because people are made in the likeness of God. That is, they bear his image. Now, even though the image of God is defaced and disgraced in the fall, it's not entirely eradicated, as this text makes clear to us. Mankind remains the highest order of living creature with a reasonable soul, a rational mind, um, a movable will, affections. Mankind re re retains in many ways the image of God. And if you, think, if you think of Romans 1, it says even the natural world, the skies, the mountains, de declare God's glory by revealing his creative and divine power. How much more do people, the height of his creation, speak something of what God is like. People bear God's image. They're made in his likeness. And therefore, speaking against people, tearing people down, is akin to tearing down God himself because they're made in his image. And so it's hypocrisy to bless God and then to curse others. It's this doubleness that ought not be so. And we know that we exhibit this doubleness often don't we? We see it in our lives, in our dishonoring to speech, in the way we're dismissive of others or derogatory towards others, the speech that strips someone of value by either ignoring them, saying you're not worth paying attention to, or insulting them, actually ma maligning their person. We think of d dismissive speech, you know, even things like, yeah, yeah, whatever, you know, totally dismissive that the person has no value. I couldn't care less. Don't, don't listen to that person. Or the way we could speak disdainfully of people, where we communicate that they are odious or contemptuous, um, uttering insults, what a wretch, or any really what in the blank, or what a, is that person, what a, any time that sort of tone, we're seeing this demeaning, dishonoring language used of image bearers to bring people low. And this ought not be so. Uh, often a good signal, if we're failing in our speech in this way in our homes, is to just look at what your children are saying. Don't you know, they pick up and they mimic so quickly. And you hear your child say, oh, that person, what a this. And you think, oh, no, they, they heard me say that. And you realize how inappropriate it sounds coming from the mouth of a child. And you ought to, the takeaway from that ought not be, oh, we should be more careful to speak in private. But the takeaway should be, we ought not be demeaning people in our speech. And so in our homes, let's try to keep one another accountable in how we speak about other people that we're not speaking disparagingly or demeaningly or derogatorily or dismissively. And let's call one another out to say, hey, let's not speak of others in that way. Now, as we're trying to create this positive culture of speech in our homes, one helpful uh, distinction that might be helpful to employ is to be people that can carefully distinguish between criticizing people versus criticizing ideas, right? So though someone's actions or their attitudes might be very dishonorable, as an image bearer of God, as a person, they're still worthy of honor. 
And Peter tells us this very clearly in 1 Peter 2.17. He says, honor everyone. Love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. And so you might have heard, uh, perhaps if you knew someone in the military, there's that idea of you can pay respect to someone's position even if uh, their behavior is disrespectable. And in the same way, we respect people as ones that God has created. Each person's been knit together in their mother's womb by God himself. And yet, we can distinguish that the actions or beliefs or attitudes might very well be wicked. And making the switch from being dismissively critical of people to evaluating and criticizing those ideas, it helps us in different ways. So not only does it help us not dishonor people, but it actually helps us think better. It's really easy to just categorize someone or uh, some Christian or people as the bad thing so that you don't have to ever engage with their arguments or listen to what they say. The people can just be dismissed. But if you take a critical approach at the ideas, you have to then say why the ideas are bad, why the behavior was inappropriate, and it becomes an actual time to think and to learn and to grow. Because bad guys are just expelled, but bad ideas need the work of being exposed, right? Remember Paul in 2 Corinthians 10.5 who said, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Or in Ephesians 5.11, he says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Okay, so the way we deal with bad ideas is not to just ignore them or pretend they don't exist, but to engage them and expose them. And so we want to, be, to learn to be more critical of ideas than of people. And if we can keep that line in, um, in our minds, in our homes, to say, hey, are you criticizing the idea, the behavior, or are you demeaning that person? And we can be careful in how we speak that way. James says, these things ought not be so, that we lift up God and tear down people. And James reminded us at the beginning that we do all stumble in many ways, right? We, we all know the various ways we fall short. But that doesn't mean we're supposed to give up in despair, We're expected to grow in bridling our tongues. That's what true religion partly consists of, bridling our tongues. And so we know we stumble, we know we want to do better, so what can we do? Well, the same thing we do any time we're confronted with sin in our life. First, we repent. We confess the sins of our tongue to God. We confess our sins and resolve anew to obey, to follow after God's ways, to keep his will. We repent And secondly, we believe. We put our hope in the Word Himself, Jesus Christ, the one who never once even spoke an idle word, the one who never once spoke out of turn or crossed the line or tore down another person. And we put our faith in Him knowing that His righteous words get counted as our righteous words. His perfect speech gets counted as our perfect speech. So we put our hope in Christ, the one who covers all our worthless words. But we remember also that Christ is not just the one of perfect speech, but who models to us the way to speak. And we want to be conformed to his image. And he rose to give us the Holy Spirit so that we can grow, to increasingly bridle our tongues, to speak well and not negatively of others. And really, to take a mindset that says, I can't grow, I'm just stuck here in my sin as it is, is to deny the power of the Holy Spirit that Christ died to purchase. Christ shed his blood to give you the power to change, the power to actually bridle your words. And so we want to be people who are praying constantly that the Holy Spirit would be working in us and would be more and more taking those reins of the words we say and guiding us in his ways. We want the flesh to diminish, the Spirit to do his work. And we know that our tongue, though it's small, it's mighty. And we know it can be mightily used for bad, but it can also be mightily used for good. To speak words of life, to speak words of hope, to speak words of comfort and joy and grace to others. What an opportunity we have to use our tongues in the hand of the Spirit to actually be instruments doing good as servants of Christ. So let's repent. Let's put our trust in Christ and trust the Holy Spirit's work in us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word you've spoken to us and that we have life through Jesus Christ, the word incarnate. 
Would you speak life to our souls even now? Would you convict us of sin and call us to repentance and faith in Christ and be working in us? Would your words, though even the words we've looked at tonight, would your word go to work in our heart? That the word would be a sword in the hand of the Holy Spirit to do the surgery on us that needs to be done. Would you help us to be careful about how we speak, to be watchful in our words, and to be people who are constantly seeking to follow after Christ, speaking words of grace and truth. So help us. We're a weak people, and we need your grace so much, not only your forgiveness, but your empowerment. So empower us, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our hymn of response Uh, Prayer asking that the mind of Christ would be in us, uh, especially in all that we do or say would be under God's divine control. So let's stand and sing, May the mind of Christ my Savior. After a prayer of blessing, you can can remain standing for a time of silent prayer and reflection. Heavenly Father, bless your people with the knowledge of your grace, your peace, and your kindness towards them in Jesus Christ this week and to eternity. In his name, amen.
This tube comes out right here. Oh, that is just normal. Yeah, that is, so, yeah. I try to like get it all right out the knees out. Okay. And then you know, let it drip back in so you don't sure. get the drips. Yeah, and then this just goes back up. Okay. Now, now